All right, now we move on to um, section 7.7. .7. And we have something called the comp or the polar form of complex numbers. Uh, I think you dealt with complex numbers earlier on in your math studies. Remember, complex numbers are, we call them a plus bi, but remember it's the square root of negative 1. No, oh, it's this guy here. It's the i being the square root of negative 1. Now the question is, how do we deal with this in polar form? That's what I want to look at in here. So let's begin all the stuff that we're going to do here. Learn how to write them, find products and quotients of them, and then take powers, and then take roots of these numbers. All right. So if you remember from some time in Math 63 or, or uh, let's see, Algebra 2, we have this right here. This is a complex number right here, a plus bi. That is a complex number of the coordinate plane or the uh, rectangular coordinate system here. All right, what we want to do is we want to take it into a complex plane. And so what we have is we have the real axis. We also have an imaginary axis. We're going to just use the x-axis as the real axis and the y-axis as the imaginary axis. What does it look like? It sort of looks like this right here. So the real number is that part right there. That's the x part, in a sense, of the uh, rectangular plane. And then the b is going to be the y coordinate. But we write them as a plus bi. All right, so let's plot these. So maybe I'll make my uh, x and y grid here. There we go. And then I think the highest we got is 4, because that's the highest number here. So I'm going to go out 4 as well. 4 up, 4 over here to the side, and 4 down. So with this 2 plus 3y, we're going to, from the origin, we're going to go 2 to the right, and we're going to go 3 up. So it should be right here, and then we're going to label it here. So 2 plus 3y. This should be an easy one here, just uh, doing the complex numbers here. All right, negative 3. So, so 3 to the left, 2 up would give us that, so negative 3 plus 2i, and then 4. So technically 4 would be 4 plus 0i, so we're just going to go out 4 numbers to the real part and stop right there. There's your 4. All right, negative 2, so negative 2, negative 3 down here. Oh, let me label the 4 real quick here. There's my labeling of the 4. Now negative 2, negative 3, would give us this dot here, negative 2 minus 3i. And 3 minus 2i would be positive 3, 1, 2, 3. Go down 2 units. So how about 3 minus 2i? All right, this is how you graph a complex number in the complex number plane. All right, so now the question is, how do you look at the absolute value or the magnitude of a complex number? So we put these bar lines. It's like absolute value of z or absolute value of a plus bi. And then what we do is we just take the, in a sense, essentially the r value from the origin. Or take the real part squared, imaginary part squared, add it together, take the square root of them. So all yours for this one. Practice problem number two, A, B, C, and D. Stop the um, <clears throat> stop the video if you need to, and then we go on from there. All right, hopefully you tried them yourself here. Let's go for it here. So the absolute value of negative 5 plus 12i, we're going to go with it's the absolute value of taking that negative 5 to the second power, taking the 12 to the second power, Squaring both of them, adding both of them up, and we get ourselves an answer of 13. That is the absolute value of that complex number. So what happens if it's a real number, like negative 7? In that case, you can do the whole work yourself here. 
you can just say 7 because that's exactly what absolute value means, right? If you did it the other way, and assuming that negative 7 is the real part, 0 is the complex part, notice you get the same thing here. So real, this definition of absolute value sort of includes how we do absolute value for the real numbers. All right, absolute value of just i by itself. Technically, the real part is zero. The imaginary part, or a is zero, b is one. There's like a little one right here, so it'd be zero plus one squared, or zero squared plus one squared gives us a squared of one, which is just one. So there's your absolute value of i. All right, and how about a formula here? That's what we have. The a and the b are just really just formulas. They're not numbers themselves. <clears throat> And so we say, okay, we're going to take the real part, square it. Take the imaginary part. In this case, it's a negative b. We're going to square that one. So notice when we do that, it, oh, sorry, a little fast here, comes back to the same form that we had for a positive b value as well. So remember, when we square things, the negatives really, in a sense, go away. All right, there's the absolute value of complex numbers. All right, now we have, we're going to change between the two here. So we have uh, z is equal to a plus bi. This is in, in rectangular form. So now the question is, what does this become in polar form? And so there it is, z is equal to r, the, the a value, or essentially the x value, changes into cosine theta. And the b value, the y value, changes into sine theta. All right, something we have, we should know from the previous um, section as well. All right, and then the absolute value becomes the modulus or the um, the length from the the origin to the point itself. So let's go for it. So can we write negative 1 minus i in polar co coordinates? And so we've got to figure out the angle measure. Angle measure is positive, and it's one rotation. It's only one rotation. So let's go for it here. First of all, the r is probably the easiest one to get. Just plug into the formula. It always works the same way. Technically, it's the absolute value that we just looked at here. So square root 2. Square root 2 is the r value. All right, now for the fun part. <clears throat> we have tangent of, or tangent theta of, negative 1, which is the y value over the x value, or the b over the a value here. And what's going to happen between these guys? They're just going to become positive 1. In that case, we're going to take the tangent inverse of both sides, and what that would give us tangent inverse of 1. Now, the only little problem is this will give us, as you punch it in the calculator here, or you look at your unit circle and find out when is the x value and the y value exactly the same. That's going to give us pi over 4. Now, we know that that's really not true, because if we were to graph this in polar coordinates, We're going to be in quadrant three, really. It's going to be like this. Down here. And the angle that we got was over here. This is pi over four. Pi over four is in quadrant one. So you kind of see that little relationship there happening here. Well, that's in quadrant one. We want to be in quadrant three. So in this case, we're just going to add an extra pi to this situation here. So the real angle itself is pi plus pi over 4, common denominators, of course. This be us 4 pi over 4 plus another pi over 4. That gets us 5 pi over 4. All right, lots of stuff. This is just the beginning here. All right, 
let's write this down now. Uh, see the R value is the square root of 2. And you open up that parenthesis and then the angle measurement is going to be exactly the same for both of these here. So this is cosine of 5 pi over 4 plus I sine of 5 pi over 4 and we are good to go. So there it is. Negative 1 minus I in rectangular form is this one right here in polar form. All right, let's go backwards here. Can we go from polar form back to rectangular form in this? And I think we can. In fact, it's been pretty easy. We just figure out what cosine of this would be, sine of this would be, and then multiply by 4, and we have a rectangular coordinate system. In a sense, you're just simplifying that out. And what the book does, it just distributes this little 4. 4 goes to this one, 4 goes to that one, and then find out cosine of 5 pi over 3. 5 pi over 3 would be in quadrant 4, and that would have an x value of 1 half. We're going to down root 3 over 2, so that's going to be the x coordinate is going to be 1 half. And then the y coordinates can be a negative for 3 over 2. Simplifying that out, that gets me a 2 plus, let's see, the 2 and the root 4 are going to reduce a little bit here. That's a minus sign in there. So how about a negative 2 root 3? Then don't forget the i value because you're saying that's the complex number there. All right. All right, how about the next of this here? Let's learn how to multiply and divide. Find the product and the quotient of these things in polar form. So the formula is you multiply the R's together and you add the angle measurements together when you're multiplying them. For division, you divide the R values and you subtract the angles. It's angle two subtracted from angle one. All right, let's go for it here. So it looks like we're going to do product, and then we're going to do quotient. Again, just learning how to work with these uh, polar form, polar numbers here. Let's go for it here. Let's multiply these guys out. So Z1 times Z2 would give us, and let me rewrite what we really are saying here in polar coordinates. So it's that first one there. And now it's being multiplied by that second one there. So 2 cosine 60 plus i sine 60. All right. Pretty easy here as we go about doing it here. We're going to take the r values, multiply those guys together. And then we're going to take the angle values and add those guys together. So it will be 75 plus 60. And it's the exact same thing for the sine value as well. So it would be 75 plus 60. And simplifying out, we get a 10 in front. Don't need brackets anymore because this is just going to be 135. No need for any parentheses inside that sign value. And we are done. There it is. There's the multiplication. And this tends to be a lot easier. If you're thinking about complex numbers, this tends to be a lot easier multiplication than what we did with complex numbers earlier on. All right, let's do division then. Same stuff here, division here. So Z1 divided by Z2 this time. Writing it out in polar form. The 5 cosine of 75 on top. On the bottom it's the 2 cosine of 60 and the rest there. Let's go for it here, show you that you need to do this step. You don't need to do this step. You can probably do this in your head. You're sophisticated math 15 students here. But just to show you the steps we're going to take here, there it is. It's going to be the subtraction of our angles, division of our R values. And five, 
2 doesn't go into 5, so we're going to leave it as 5 halves. Now, question comes up with the student's administration. Can I put it as 2.5? Like, divide 2 into 5. Absolutely. Can you write it as 2.5? Absolutely. All that works. All right, subtraction, subtraction of the... Angle measurements gives you this right here. And there should be a little parenthesis right there as well. So there it is. All right, practice problem number six, we're going to skip. It has to do with uh, complex numbers and AC circuits. It's a long problem. I think we, we can skip that one. All right, we are going to go to De Moivier's theorem. So now, this is uh, taking powers of complex numbers. That's what we're going to see what we do here. So how do you take powers of complex numbers? Again, it's a different way to do it in rectangular form. You have to multiply, foil it out, foil it out, foil it out, and keep on foiling it out. With the complex form, it's easy. You just take the exponent of the r value and you multiply the theta value by the exponent that you're trying to get. A lot easier to do it in polar form. All right, so let's go for it. There it is, z is equal to negative 1 plus i. Let's use de Moivier's theorem to find the power of z. So z to the eighth power, we're going to take negative 1 plus i to the eighth power. We could foil it out eight times. I just don't think we want to do that. So first things first, we've got to put it into polar form. So we take that and we go negative 1 squared plus 1 squared eventually becomes 1 plus 1 or the square root of 2. Now we're going to use that for both problems anyways. So once we get to this polar form then, then we can actually get to the problem itself. We've got to figure out how to put this into um, complex form first. Alright and Tangent theta is the B value over the A value. In this case, you're going to get negative 1. Now, when you do this here, when you take the tangent inverse of negative 1, you're going to find out you're not in the quadrant you want to be in. So when you do that, you're going to get yourself a negative pi over 4. So if you look at a quadrant basis here, We've found out that we are pretty much down here. Here's my pi over 4, negative pi over 4. What we want to do is we actually want to be in quadrant 2 because notice it's a negative a value, so it's negative a, positive b, so it's this one, so it's negative 1 plus 1. So where the rectangular form is right here, where we just figured out that we're here, so we are off by hey, a pi. So let's add pi, and that will get us to where we want to be. All right, so pi plus a negative pi over 4, common denominators. I think you guys can do that. Eventually, you should get a 3 pi over 4. All right, it's kind of like, or that that's the normal process. Sometimes what you can really do is you can just graph this and sometimes you can kind of see where you need to be here. So notice if you're at negative 1 plus 1, so you know the x value is a negative 1, the y value is positive 1, that puts you about right here. That puts you at a 45 degree angle because they're both the same in quadrant 2. So if you say to yourself, you know what, that's going to be 3 pi over 4 because that's the equivalent of 135 degrees. So if you can figure out the angle measurement very easily, do it that way. If you can't, then you're going to go this sort of long route here. All right, and anyway, 
how about this z or the complex number becomes the square root of 2 and it's the cosine of 3 pi over 4 plus i sine of 3 pi over 4 All right, now we can start doing this here. So, uh, taking a, a quick little uh, snapshot of the previous answer, the previous slide, what we want to do is we want to take this to the eighth power. So, how about z to the eighth power is, and we're going to take that to the exponent of that one. And then all we do is we multiply the angle measurement, and it's going to be the exact same angle measurement for both sides, so you really need to think about it once and then the rest is going to be writing it down again here. So the square root of 2 to the eighth power, again think about what that's going to mean, but it's root 2, root 2, root 2, root 2, eight times, or you could say, you know what, isn't this little radical, isn't that really just a half? So if we think about exponents, you say, look, eight times a half is four, so two to the fourth power, so two times two is four, times another 2 would be 8, times another 2 would be 16. I like that better. 16. Uh, let's see, 4 and 8. The 4 will reduce this guy down to a, a 2. 2 times 3 is 6. So here it is. Cosine 6 pi plus i sine 6 pi, and we are done. We have taken powers of a complex number. All right, we can convert this back into rectangular coordinates. Remember, because the whole point is to get it back to rectangular coordinates here. And we have ourselves 1 plus i times 0. And when we get that, we get ourselves 16. So there's a 16. And that would be back to rectangular coordinate system. That's a whole bunch easier than taking we're doing foil eight times over. All right, let's do this again, and now let's take it to the, let's see, I'm gonna check here, negative 12th power. All right, negative 12th power would look like this, and then if we do this here, it would be square root of 2. And then uh, taking that to the negative 12th power. Then inside here, brackets, cosine of negative 12 times 3 pi over 4. So we're going to go in the negative angle category, but that's okay. Negative 12, 3 pi over 4. Cool with that. <clears throat> All right, so the little negative exponent, remember what that means? That means reciprocals, all right? So if that case, you get yourself 1 over the square root of 2 to the positive 12th power. And then this would be cosine, let's see, uh, 4 goes into 12 three times, so it would be negative 3 times 3 pi or negative 9 pi. Plus, and then again, same exact angle over here as well, negative 9 pi. And you could use brackets. Notice my brackets turn into parentheses. That's fine. Parentheses and brackets, they're the same exact thing anyways. Okay, so here it is. This guy 12 times, if you want to do that. Or, again, think of this little square root as a 1 half. So it could be uh, 2 to the 6th power. So square root of 2 to the 12th power, or 2 to the 6th power, and that would give us a 64. So 1 over 64. Again, try it yourself. And then we're going to see what happens here. Cosine of negative pi over 9. Again, look at a unit circle. Negative. Uh, let's see if I can do it up here. If we go negative pi, negative 2 pi, negative 3 pi, negative 4 pi, negative 5 pi, 6 pi, 7 pi, 8 pi, 9 pi, we end up right over here. 
So if we're on the unit circle, that turns out to be negative 1 comma 0. So the y, the x coordinate is negative 1. The y coordinate is a 0. And in this case, we get an answer of negative 1 64th. Now, will you get I values in there sometime? Yes, you will. When the I, when the sine value becomes something other than zero. All right, that's taking powers of complex numbers. Let's go to taking roots. So we want to take a square root of complex numbers, and this one probably deserves at least uh, maybe like looking at a, an example number eight, and then actually doing example number eight because it's. There's a lot of little pieces to this here. So notice we're going to do kind of like the same thing here. We're going to say we're going to take the 1 over n or the nth root of r. And then over here, then over here looks like something strange here. What we do is we figure out how many roots we want. So if we are going to take it to the sixth root, we're going to do this six times. So we're going to take 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We're going to replace with the angle measurement. So the angle measurement is the one that moves quite a bit. All right, so we add 360 each time. So in a sense, what we have is we're adding a full revolution, and then we're dividing by the nth or the end value, which is the root. All right, let's take a look at it kind of quickly here. Let's see. This is example number eight from the textbook itself. It says find the three cube roots. So we're going to take this to the cube root of one plus i. So there's your um, rectangular form. We want to put into polar form first. And if we do that, again, depending which way you want to do it, degrees or radians. It's sometimes a lot easier to work in degrees than radians. That's why they do it here. You're going to get the same answers both ways anyway, so it really doesn't matter. So let's go for it here. So you can convert it into the square root of 2, which we've been converting already, right? And cosine of pi over 4 plus i sine pi over 4, or 1 plus i convert it to using degree values of square root of 2, cosine 45, and sine of 45. Okay, so once we get this form right here, then we're going to put it into the general form for de Moivier's theorem. It says since we're taking the third root, the r value is going to be taken to 1 over 3, because that's really the same thing as third root. And then we're going to add... One, two, three, we're going to add three multiples of n eventually here. We're going to start off with zero, and then we're going to do one, and then we're going to do two. So in a sense, we start off with under a full revolution. Then we're going to go one full revolution, and then some, and then a second full revolution, and then some. And so for z, zero, the first or the initial value here, that's same, but we're going to say, look, it's 0 times 360. It's really it's going to be 45 divided by 3. That's all it's going to be. So there's no revolution happening out. So that would be 15, and it's going to be the other same. So this is one answer right here. This is one root. We need to find, remember, we need to find three roots here. All right, the next one. This one's going to be 1 full revolution plus 45 divided by 3. So it turns out to be 135. And the last one, because you go out, only go out to n minus 1. So there it is. Now you got two full revolutions. 360 times 2, 720 plus 45 divided by 3 gives you 255. So there it is. There's your three cube roots of that number. Now, do you need to change it to rectangular form uh, depends on the problem that you're doing. In this case, since you're just practicing using how to do this here, you don't need to. All right, our problem. Here it is. Find the three cube roots of negative 1 plus i. 
So let's figure out the r value. So negative 1 squared plus 1 squared, that would be a square root of 2 eventually. Cool, we had that before. And then we have to figure out the com or yeah, polar form here. So b over a gets me a negative 1, so tangent inverse of negative 1. Already looked at that before. That gives us an answer in quadrant 4 based upon this value of negative pi over 4. But if you look at the numbers here, that means negative 1 plus 1. So negative 1 plus 1 should actually be um, in this territory here. So negative pi over 4, that's the same thing as negative 45 degrees. In order to go from quadrant 4 to quadrant 2, what we're, we're going to do is going to add 180 degrees. If we do that, 180 plus a negative 45, that gets you 135 degrees. There's where we begin. All right, so what is this stuff that we need to know? In fact, let me just do the first iteration of it here. If we say, look, n is equal to 3. So what we're going to do is we're going to take square root of 2 to the 1 third. Again, cosine is, since the first iteration is there's no, it's 0 times 360. We really don't usually put 360 down here. Write it like this as the work for it. And then let's reduce this down as much as we can here. In this case, again, this little square root is one half, so it's one half times a third, so one sixth. So how about two to the one sixth? And then 135 divided by three gets you 45 degrees, and that is the first one. Well, we have to do two more here. So this is where the multiplier of 360 is zero. Next one here, here's where it's a 1, so the multiplier of 360 is 1. Now, can you already simplify the r value since we know it already? Absolutely. But 135 divided plus 360 divided by 3 this time. Again, same angle measurement here. That's going to be 2 to the 1 sixth, as we already know to be already here. Here's the work for it if you want to see it here. So that little squirt of the square root symbol or the radical symbol changes to an exponent of 1 half. That's going to be a multiplication between these two right there. And we get ourselves 135 plus 360 divided by 3 gets you 165 here. All right, and the only simplification is right here. Do you need to do that? So that's why a lot of students do this in one step, so they have to rewrite the whole thing all over again. All right, and one last one here. Z2. So this is the third. Notice I wrote down the R value already. No, we're going to get the same thing all the time anyways. Why well, write it down multiple times? So really, the only thing we've got to figure out is the angle measurement. So it's 135 plus now two rotations of 360 divided by 3. So we just need to figure that one out, and then we have ourselves all the answers we need. So 2 to the 1 sixth, and that's going to be 720 plus 135 divided by 3, 285, says so my calculator over here. And we have our answer Right there, there's the third cube root. All right, and the last problem here. All right, so really what we're going to do is we're going to look at complex numbers. It's called the roots of unity. Technically, we're doing, we're taking roots of one. That's what we're doing. Same as straight. That's kind of weird. Yeah, isn't square root of one is just one? Yes, in the real number plane. But we can take 
the square root of 1 inside the complex number plane, and that takes on a whole new shape. So let's go for it here. What are we looking at? We're looking at a fourth root of 1. So let's convert 1 into a polar form. Polar form, everybody okay with this? 1 plus 0i. That's, that's technically 1 in polar form. So converting it to the r value, it's going to be 1 squared plus 0 squared. And so the r value is still 1. Okay. And then what we're going to do is we've got to convert the angle measurement here. So this is 0 over 1, or the x value over the, sorry, the y value over the x value, or b over a. And we have ourselves zero degrees, which kind of makes sense, right? If you're if you're the real number one on the Cartesian coordinate plane, you're technically right here, right? You're not at the origin; you are on the side there, one unit away. All right, let's go for it here. So let's write the general form here: z to the k value is going to be one to the one fourth because k is 4. That's going to be cosine of 0 degrees plus rotations of 360 times k all over 4. There's a general form. And then we're just going to do iterations of k how many times? So according to our little, we're going to use 0, one, two, and three. And that's what we want to use in order to get those groups or roots of unity. All right, let's go for it here on this one. Let's start with the first one here, zero. So z of zero, which technically just means k equals zero. So that's a one. That's always going to be one there. But this was an easy one here. You got cosine, zero degrees divided by four, still zero degrees. And we we'll leave it just like that. All right, just so we can see everything on the same slide, what I did is I copied the last two equations right here onto the next slide. So we have them with this as we do it. So there's the, there they are right there. So now let's go on with the next ones here. So Z1. It may still be 1. Now this is going to be 0 plus 360, so it's divided by 4. So 360 divided by 4, technically that's what I got. All right, and putting it together would be just 90 degrees. There's a second group of unity. The third one would be using the k value equals to 2. That makes seven, 360 times 2 is just 720 divided by 4. 720 divided by 4. And we get ourselves a final answer 1 cosine of 180 plus i sine of 180. Again, if I'm going too fast, you have total right to pause the video. Try it yourself. Then unpause me. All right, so now this is going to be 360 times 3. So it's 1080 divided by 4. And we get ourselves, let's see, today do I have 270. So 270, I sine 270. There it is. There is the four fourth roots of one. That's just kind of weird, like, because we always thought that square root of one is just one all the time. And again, that is in the real number system, yes. In the complex number system, it changes. What we usually like to do as well, just um, to see the symmetry behind it here, is we can graph these. And so if we take the time here, I know you guys learned how to graph the last section here. Can you graph these guys out? So R value is 1, and look at the angle value. So if we're to graph these out here, this is 1 cosine 0 plus I sine 0. So the angle measurement is 0 and you go out one unit away. Then the next angle measurement is 90 degrees, and you go out one unit away.
the next angle measurement is 180, and you're going one unit away from the origin. And the last one is 720, one unit away from the origin. So notice this is how the fourth roots of unity look like right here. And we usually what we do is we connect them because it forms different shapes. So there it is. It forms a little, it should be a square actually. And you'll see different sort of shapes in the textbook as well based upon how many groups of unity we need. All right, so that finishes off the lecture for 7.7 .7 and Chapter 7.